Please welcome Judge Myers. If I can just start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, pay my respects to their elders past and present, and every other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person here today. Um, I was um, approached by the Attorney General at the end of 2016 and asked to be involved or be the Commissioner on the inquiry into Indigenous incarceration. Um, terms of reference were delivered in early February last year. It was a very, very tight, short timetable of about 10 months. Um, Chris Canese, earlier Anthony, is here today. Um, they will bunk on the advisory committee for the inquiry. I'm grateful for their input and their time. Um, the terms of reference, people said, oh, gee, they're so wide. They're such wide terms of reference. How will you possibly do it? But in actual fact, they weren't at all. If you have a look at the terms of reference, they excluded a really, really important point. The terms of reference didn't allow the inquiry to consider um, the incarceration of children. It didn't, it was, didn't allow us to consider that very, very early point where we see people feeding into the criminal justice system. If it's a, if, if the, running the inquiry, it, it looked to me very much like a conveyor belt. And the conveyor belt doesn't start when people turn out and it starts much younger than that. I went outside the terms of reference and made recommendations for an inquiry or a national review of the child protection laws in this country um, because you couldn't see what we saw and not realise that things start much, much earlier than at 18. On the day we received the terms of reference, so I was sitting with Don Weatherburn, people know probably Dr Don Weatherburn, and almost overwhelmed and said to Don, where can we pick up where are some real pressure points that we can try and work on? He said, well, we'll take remand. Let's just take the remand population. A 230 or 240-odd percent increase in remand of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in New South Wales in the last 15 years. So a pretty big, pretty big increase. Near on 30% of all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people sitting in, um, in prisons are on remand. So a big percentage as well. He said, here's the thing that's really, really hard to swallow. He said, of those people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people sitting in remand in New South Wales that go to trial and get convicted, so they go to trial, they sit in there, in some cases for up to 80 months and get convicted, about 38% of those receive no custodial sentence. Think about this. Not... Not a custodial sentence for time served. They received none. If they pleaded guilty on day one, they would have gone home. It's outrageous. Think about that. We've locked people up. They were never going to go to jail. But because they couldn't get bail, they sat in remand. They dared to say, I want to defend my case. And when you defend your case and you lose, you don't, get a, you don't get a discount for an early guilty plea. You get the maximum of the often enraged magistrate or otherwise district court judge who feels as though his or her time has been wasted. So 38%, no custodial sentence. That's just terrible. It's outrageous. Look, poverty is a massive driver. In fact, everything I saw relates back to poverty. It really does. I, I, the, this, the first week I flew out to Dubbo and I met with um, Jeff McKenzie, the Deputy Commissioner of Police in New South Wales. A really caring fellow. He said, look, we're running this really, really good program up in Dubbo. We're getting kids in, Aboriginal kids in. They're at risk. We know they're at risk and their families have, have fallen into juvenile justice. We get them in in the morning. We give them breakfast. We take them to school. They're going OK. They're going to school, it's a good program, it's working. We're getting some of those kids, they've got a, a, a thing called IPRAV, which is a program to try and get Aboriginal kids into the police force. So that works well, we get through school. He said, and then we pick them up, <coughs> because they don't have a driver's license. And we pick them up again, because out in Dubbo you need to drive. You want to go to Narramine? You're not going to catch the local bus. You can't catch the light rail of Narramine or out to Wellington. And he said, we just keep picking these kids up. Eventually, pick them up and up, they go to jail. 
I said, well, what's happening? He said, the test that we've set in this country, or at least in this state and across the other states and territories, require in New South Wales 120 hours worth of supervised driving. I know people who are wealthy in Sydney that struggle with that. He said, up, up here, 120 hours worth of petrol? See, that's serious. I sat down with, um, sat down and tried to work out how far could I drive. I could at least surf and navigate the country. Probably more. You don't have the money for petrol, you can't do the driving. You don't have access to a registered vehicle, you can't do the driving. You've got literacy problems, you can't cobble together your stupid work book. Wow, so set up the barrier. In some communities we saw people without birth certificates. You don't have a birth certificate, you can't get a driver's license. Again, relating back to issues of poverty. So many, so many times we saw poverty as a driver. When we go back to that bail question, why are we putting people in remand? They're in remand because they can't get bail. They're in remand because they can't they've got no housing. And, that's, and if you don't have housing, you don't get bail. And for some of the offences, you can't go home. You've been excluded as a bail condition. One of the bail conditions will be you can't go back home. So you've got nowhere to live. I was down in Adelaide and met with Justice and they pulled out these enormous scrolls of plans and said, here's our new $2 billion jar we want to build. But we don't have the money. So we're looking at ways to reduce incarceration. But seriously, they said, here's our $2 billion jar that we want to build, but we cannot. So we're now looking seriously. Like, and they said it deadpan. They weren't fucking <laughs> around. It was absolutely, like, we were just like, gobsmacked. But nevertheless, that's what they said. And they were serious about it. So they said, we, we, know, we know that bail is problematic. So down in Port Adelaide, we've funded an NGO, Anglicare, to build a bail hostel. And they said, we know if we do that, we've actually got to do something serious about it. So they forward funded Anglicare 15 years worth of contract, up front, seriously. I've ne and all, in the entire time I did the inquiry, I've never seen anybody do that. But when you can forward fund 15 years, or you've got two billion and you don't have it, 15 years worth of funding to build, to build a bail hostel was good. One of the things that they did do down there, which is, is interesting, is they provided wraparound services. They, they're using it as a staging place. It's basically a bail brokerage facility. We get you in, we've got housing there. It's not permanent. Get you in, get get you out of, out of the system, get you out of what's going to be jail, and we'll get you into housing. And that's been working. I was lucky enough to speak to somebody from Agriculture and they said, this, this is actually a good one. We could do this because we had the funding, otherwise we couldn't have built it. We couldn't have done this without 15 years worth of funding. Can you all hear me, by the way? I just want to make sure. Yes? Yeah. They couldn't have otherwise done it, but they did. Across the country, when I spoke to different communities, nobody said to me, gee, if only there was more funding for programs. Some communities there are washed with money for programs. But they're programs that are being delivered by people that are thriving in. They're programs that are being delivered to Aboriginal people, not by Aboriginal people, not designed by Aboriginal people, not for Aboriginal people. And a lot of people, a lot of cases say, look, there's these programs. We just don't need them. They actually don't suit our needs. They're not actually really one, they're not designed for us. Two, they're not really answering the question or the, the difficulty we've got. But I've, I've, I've heard in some cases PMC funding separately. Two NGOs doing the same job that nobody wants in town, not even speaking to each other. I don't know whether anybody's had much to do with the um, Maranooka project up at Perth. Do people aware of that? A little bit? Yeah. It's, it was interesting to go go up to Burke. They, they had to do what's called, well, they did data mapping to work out, one, what was the problems. They identified that, engaging with the local, local community. But they also did um, programs mapping. What, what, what services are actually, 
what's pouring into this town? We need to sit down and work this out. And again, they found so many NGOs not speaking to each other, not, not engaging with each other, just this enormous amount of money pouring into the town. If you, if you know Burke well, some time ago, they ended up on the front page of the paper as, as being one of the most violent, worst places in the world. And some of the locals there said, gee we that just, that can't be right. Surely that, that can't be us. Surely we can do something about it. Um, and that's really what spawned the, the project, Maranuga. It's interesting because they, they, asked the, they asked the community, what can we do about problems and how do you solve them? And one of the ones that they had, they had a, quite a bad public drinking problem. If you know, that it's, a, it's, weird, it's actually a poor town. It's actually on a river. There's a big port. And, um, anyway, down at, down at the dock, there was a big public drinking problem. In the park, there was a big public drinking problem. And instead of saying, we, we will do, as I've seen so many times, we will create an alcohol-free zone. We will do this. We will, we will tell you how you will fix it. They didn't do that. They said, how can we fix it? One, it's a given you need to, and there was no debate. But two, how do we fix it? And the community came back and said, well, well, if we tell you, will you do it? And the answer was, well, we'll at least try. And they said, delete these lines, these items from the bottle shop. Delete these items from the pub. And instead of saying, OK, well, thanks for telling us. Um, we'll get back to you. They did it. Guess what? No more public drinking. And it was the same with family rights. What, what can we do about that? And they said, if something's happening in the household, the community needs to be involved. So if there's a complaint, so the elders need to go with the police as well. They need to be there so that, that we know what's going on. And they've done that. They, again, they listen. And, and yes, there's still a, a family violence problem in Burke, as there are in many other towns. Right across this nation, there's a problem. But the numbers are significantly coming down. Significantly coming down because Aboriginal people know their problems. If you ask Aboriginal people, often they know what you need to do to fix it, but so many times nobody is listening. Um, it was interesting spending time with the police, seeing some of the projects they were doing, seeing, seeing one, their, their failures, but two, seeing some, in some cases where there was genuine engagement with the community, things working. <clears throat> I don't know, do people know about Luke Friedenstein's project down in Redford? The, the boxing program? Yeah, okay, I'll ask them. One, one of the things that we said, and one of the things that is probably true across all these programs, is they're personality driven. And people said, oh, well, that doesn't work. But the reality is that it actually does. When things are personality driven, when they're driven by the local community, by personalities, they do work. It's, it's, it won't, it, rolling out programs across states won't work. And somebody said to me, but how can that be? Why, why is that? And I said, well, every community is different. And they said, oh, well, yes and no. I said, no, well, it actually is. I said, just think about the realities of just the physical landscape of it. If you think things are, things are all the same, well, they're actually not. I was in, up in Burke. We're here, where we are right at the moment. We're in New South Wales. We're in northern New South Wales. Driving or being driven here. It's pretty lush and green. There's plenty of water. Things are going well. Looks all pretty good. But it is. I was in Burke a couple of weeks ago. There's a heartbreaking drought going on out there, the type of which they've never seen. The landscapes are so different that it, 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 people say it can't possibly be even the same country. And that's the reality. Our country is so vast. 
but our communities because of that are so different. But if we just roll things out, if we said, we'll roll out a, a water program, people here will say, what are you talking about? What, what are you going to build bigger gutters so we can channel the water out to sea so we don't flood and out in Burton? They're saying, well, we need water because you know, our, our, our land is dry. Land. So that, that's what we see in, that, in this landscape in criminal justice. Um, Luke said to me, I've spoken around the country in, um, in states and territories. I've been, I've spoken internationally. He said, I haven't once spoken in New South Wales. That was interesting. The other thing he said, and he's about to retire, he said, my, my greatest fear is I'll retire. I mean, there is no plan. No plan in place to see him replaced so that his program continues. And we picked that up in the report and we made a bit of a song and dance about it. And they actually did find somebody to replace Luke. I think probably did one heat screen about it and we screamed about it. And luckily we had Jeff McKechnie on our advisory committee and something was done. But that, that does happen so many times. So many times good programs are really, really good. They do, do good work and that's a good thing. You should not do these programs because maybe they'll end if you do something, even if it's for 12 months and they work, that's good. But you really need to start thinking about, thinking about what takes place when that person leaves. Start putting some things in place to make sure those good programs carry on. It's, there are a lot of good things that are taking place across the country that are driven by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So it's not all disastrous. It's, the, the numbers are disastrous. But it's not all bad because we're, in, in some areas, we see things really, really working. Because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been given some control to be able to say, this is a one, this is a program a problem we have got, two, this is a program that will work. One of the as I said, one of the my biggest concerns out of probably all of it was looking at what's taking place with juvenile justice and seeing that kids going on the conveyor belt. One of the one of the biggest drivers of that is really our home care. Um, tonight, well, one in ten Aboriginal children in New South Wales will sleep in out of home care. Ten percent of the, the New South Wales Aboriginal child population will be in out of home care. Peter Johnson, the president of the Children's Court, who oversees the system that has placed children into care, not the, not the Department of Family and Community Services, but the court itself, wrote a paper about eight months ago and he called it the crossover kids. Kids crossing over, right, and particularly Aboriginal kids from out of home care into juvenile justice. And we know that once you start on that pathway, you keep on going into adult incarceration. And we know the recidivism rates are so high, you're just going to keep coming back. How, how does it work? Like, really? We know the stats. What, what, why are people doing this? Why are they crossing over? And it's, it's actually not that complex. There's a very large percentage, more than, more than two thirds of Aboriginal children being removed and being removed from neglect. Not for abuse. If, you, if you're abusing kids, take the kids away. I've got no problems with that whatsoever. You want to abuse your children, you talk to your kids. But for, for those parents that are really struggling, and again, I go back to issues of poverty. Across the inquiry, we were told, so I thought, and a lot of people in the, in the hours, I thought, look, a lot of people are receiving Centrelink and they've got money coming in. Why is this all going on? There's a social safety net. In some of the areas, we were told less than 20% of the Aboriginal population that are entitled to receive a Centrelink payment receive a Centrelink payment because they can't feel like they're getting idiotic forms. Their computer will be true. Nobody's here to help them. They don't have a birth certificate. They have no access. So they don't get birth certificates. 
they don't know those things. They don't get Centrelink. They either crowd into a home where somebody's got some money, because that's what family's about. And if you are, okay, if you are, if you overcrowd, what actually then happens is disasters happen. You stick 20 people in a house, it's not going to end. It's going to go end nicely. People's campers get frayed. It just doesn't work. Anyway, but if we go back to that conveyor belt, looking back at what's happening with kids in our home care, if you are removed from your parents who aren't abusing you, you're really, really upset. They are human beings. They really, really hate. They hate the police. You've stolen me from my mum and dad. So that's your first, possibly your first time you come into contact with the police. I remember when I was a kid, my grandmother, my mum was removed for a period of time anyway. My, she was returned ultimately because my grandmother married somebody that managed to get it back. But I can remember as a little kid, we would drive past the police, my grandmother would say, get down. Get, and she was serious. She absolutely hated the police. You, know, you don't like the police if you if you, they took you away from mum and dad. And when you lose your mum and dad, you've lost part of your family. But the other thing that we know that happens is we can't get sorry that you've got four, four siblings. You're not going to see them again. We're not going to find you a placement where anybody's going to take three or four. And you're not going to be living next door to each other. So say bye bye. So on day one, you've lost your mum and your dad, you've lost your siblings. And here's the next thing in the tale for you. If, if you go and got your mum and dad, you don't have your, you don't have your siblings. Hopefully, you've still got your friends because they're important, but you lose those two. Because that's right, we can't find a placement for you where you're going to end up living in an area so you can go to the same school. So good start, day one. Mum's gone, dad's gone, siblings are gone, your friends are gone somewhere else. It's, to be honest, getting paid and kittens to look after you. So day one, second school. Not very happy, not doing very well, probably a little bit annoyed, maybe pretty pissed off. Anyway, the foster care says, look, you know what, you're, you're pretty hard work, maybe it's time for you to go to the next place. We know in New South Wales the average number of placements is 10. Good, isn't it? Average number of placements in New South Wales for child and care care. The long, the long cycle through. I'll try and be quick and I'll finish on this note. But just about this. So anyway, so you go to your first placement, your second school, you go to your second placement, your third school, you go to your third placement, your fourth school, and so on and so on. And if we know this about trying to fit in, if anybody's gone from school to school, how do you fit in? You muck up. You be the class clown. You don't conform. You don't be the teacher's pet, you're not going to win any friends with that. So you really start to muck up. Which is seeing your cycling in and out of houses because people are getting pretty tired of you. Anyway, because you're falling into a bad crowd, because you're mucking up, you're going to come into contact with the police. But we were trying, I remember you. I remember you. So you're not very respectful to them either. And if you're not very respectful to the police, you don't get a very good ride. So we see those kids falling into the juvenile justice system where there's, it's just hopeless. Where ultimately, and the, the cost of this is really, really high. You're talking about like incarceration <laughs> sitting in the, the high three billions, out of home care is at about $2.8 billion. This is a serious system. It's got a, it's a lot of inertia behind this system. There's a lot of people involved in this. There's a whole industry all out of this. This is not, not something we can derail quickly. That's why I've, I've, one of my biggest recommendations is to be a national inquiry into it. Because it's the start. It sees, it sees our kids incarcerated. And if our kids keep getting incarcerated, they end up incarcerated into adulthood. So um, that's really been what's been happening. I invite you to read the report. It covers a range of different topics. There's some recommendations. It'll make some tangible differences. There's some real things that can be done. So it uncovers uncovers what's going on with the prison population, where prison statistics were gathered on a census basis, and programs are designed around those needs from that census. But because it's a census-based approach, where you're taking a snapshot on one night in a given year, it failed to uncover what's really, but they uncovered what's called the stock of 
what was in prison on that night, but it failed to uncover or failed to really look at the massive turnover where we know we were able to find those statistics out from actual rates of people going in and out of prison and some sentencing rates. So many people are going in and out on short sentences. If you're going in and out on a six-month sentence or a three-month and a, three and a three month sentence, that, that bed that was one person on a six-month sentence is used twice or four times in a year. So many people are going in and out on short sentences. And if they're going in and out on short sentences, there aren't any programs. There's no chance for rehabilitation. If you're sitting in remand for 18 months waiting for your sentence, you're never going to get one in the end anyway. You don't get any programs. There's no rehabilitation. So it's it's a a lot is a lot of a lot of what we're seeing is driven by poverty. A lot of the things that we're seeing that are being driven are because we're approaching things in a way that doesn't work. We're not asking the community. We're telling the community what you should do. And when you ask the community, one, they've got answers, and two, they've got solutions. So I invite you to read the read the report. You can download it online. It's about as big as the Bible. It's about 500 pages, but please bear, bear through it. There's an executive summary, so I'll happy to answer questions later. Thank you.